show on the road. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. I see some of my students here. Thanks for coming. Some of my past students. Very excited to see y'all. So my name is uh, Alicia Swizdrell. Miss Swizz, Alicia Swizz is what some of y'all may know me as. If you've had me as a professor before, um, what we are going to see today will come as no surprise or shock to you. Um, because in my class I teach media and pop culture here at Harold Washington and I teach them from a feminist perspective which means we talk about the way that gender and gender identity is constructed through the media and pop culture and um, because I am woman identifying and I love the ladies we do a lot of talking about women in my class because I think that's important and they're often left out of the dialogue and so this event today is a part of Humana Festivo, and there's a lot of other events going on on campus um, sponsored by the Humanities Department. So let's just clap it up a little bit for the Humanities Department. Everybody here at Harold Washington. Yeah, um, y'all are really lucky to be students at a pretty amazing uh, public institution and super happy to be here with a project of mine that I started about two years ago called Slut Talk. And Slut Talk is a true storytelling show and series where I invite um, women and femme identified individuals to tell true stories about their experience with slut shaming, slut culture, body politics, anything kind of under that umbrella of sex, sexuality, and um, gender identity. And for women, oftentimes those are negative experiences, but there's a lot of positivity and power in our experiences as well. So today what you're going to see are six performers from the community here in Chicago. Some are actors, some are writers, some are comedians, some are musicians, some are all of the above. And information on them can be found in the playbill that I handed out. So please hang on to this after the show. Check out their bios. Check, out them, check them out on social media. Um, if you like what you see today, chances are you can see them doing other events and entertaining type work in the community. Many of them also have um, other creative pursuits that they do. Some are designers, some have bands, some have a book, some host radio shows. So there's a lot of ways to see them in action outside of what you're going to see today. Um, so what you're going to see today is six different performances all under the umbrella of Slut Talk. And um, yeah, all of these performers were invited here and they are here because they're super excited to perform specifically for students. Um, as performers in the community, we spend a lot of time performing in bars, sometimes nightclubs, not always in settings where people know you're going to be there or even necessarily want you to be there. So it's always fun to have a nice, receptive, student-filled audience. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to your professors who inspired and encouraged you to come. And I just want to say extra special thank to the Committee on Women's and Gender Studies here at Harold Washington, which include Jen and Amanda back there. What's up? Um, they may be your professors as well. And we've all worked really hard to um, bring you this event today. And just want to say thanks again for coming. Um, I would like to ask you right now to please silence your phones. However, um, all of the performers you see today are have pretty solid social media presences. So if you want to take a picture or write a tweet about how you're watching this amazing show and you're seeing this killer performer, we don't mind you having your phones out as long as you're using them to document the show and um, not to like text your boyfriend. No texting boys. Um, just kidding, but not really. Um, okay, so uh, that being said, um, after the performance, which will run um, around an hour, maybe a little less, um, all the performers are going to stick around and bring their chairs up front and we're going to do like a Q&A open dialogue. Um, so that would be a great time to ask any questions that either relate to your class content or if you just have questions. Um, nothing's really off limits. Everybody came to play. And um, that being said, we're going to get the show on the road. So let's clap it up for Slut Talk 2018. <laughs> all right. Um, our first performer today read right here. So um, 
is Ella Emma Alamo. Emma Alamo is a Chicago-based writer and storyteller with a penchant for finding humor in difficult topics. She has been fe featured on the Risk podcast and has a story airing this month on the brand new Lenny Says podcast. Her Facebook presence is an ongoing source of stress for her family members. Hmm, whose is it, am I right? When she's not behind a computer or microphone, you can find her in her studio working on her line of leather bondage harnesses for women and gender minorities of all shapes and sizes. You can check out those harnesses and her writing at emmaalamo.com. Please put your hands together for Emma Alamo. didn't know each other's last names. We didn't live in the same city, and we bought our condoms from the 24-hour Walgreens across the street from Estelle's. We seemed scripted to be nothing more than a one-night stand, but the next morning we found a way to fuck that up. We woke up with our arms still around each other, had sex again, fell asleep again, then woke up again, and just for the hell of it I asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? Either a Muppeteer or a TV writer. He answered right away, as though he'd been expecting the question. As though this were a typical thing for a 27-year-old to ask a 29-year-old. What about you? I told him about a woman I'd met while on tour the previous summer. She'd published several novels, was the artistic director of an immersive theater company, and had come to my show on a date with a man 15 years younger than her. I want to be her, I said. <laughs> Julian laughed and pulled me closer. I let my head fall into his chest. He kissed my forehead and wham, just like that, we were in love. But I had to get to work and by the time my shift ended, he would be on a plane. You know, I said, I'm gonna be in New York for a few days in March. This wasn't even a lie. I did actually have plans to go to New York. I mean, if I hadn't, I would have probably found an excuse to make such plans, but that's besides the point. Julian smiled. Let me take you on a date, he said. Our fate was sealed. We were to spend the next three months texting and stalking each other on Facebook and exchanging selfies that had been strategically planned to look spontaneous. <laughs> Julian told me that he loved my writing and that he wished we'd had more time together and that he felt this connection with me. I started building the date up in my head to be the night that we would talk about in our wedding vows. I mean, I continued to slut my way around Chicago, but I'm an excellent multitasker. <laughs> and I kept Julian at a steady simmer on the back burner the whole time, kept him set aside as the inevitable real thing. A couple of weeks before I left for New York, I blacked out while bar hopping with my friend Adam. The next day I told him that all I remembered of the previous night was standing in the bathroom of a bar, staring at my hazy reflection in the mirror, and hearing a tiny voice in my head say, it's time to go home, Emma. There's nothing for you here. Dude, Adam said, that wasn't a voice in your head, that was me, I said that to you. <laughs> I wasn't ready to fully confront my drinking problem, but at this point it was abundantly clear that most aspects of my life would work better if I let them dry out a bit. So I didn't drink that day, or the next day, or the day after that. When my plane touched down in New York, I hadn't had a drop in 13 whole days. I was doing great, so great in fact, that I deserved to reward myself with alcohol. I wouldn't go crazy, I'd just, you know, drink moderately. That's the thing people do, right? I told myself I'd have one to three drinks that night, and that was it, just one to three. Julian and I met up at a restaurant near his house in Bushwick, and I ordered a beer. We were both nervous. We kept talking at the same time, but somewhere near the bottom of my pint glass, we found our flow. That was drink number one. We stopped at a bar on the way to Manhattan for drink number two. At the theater, Julian bought us each a bullshit $18 cocktail, and when I'd sucked down the last of the melted ice, I finally started to feel like myself, like the person I wanted to be. That was drink number three. The show ended and we ducked into a Mexican restaurant and did a round of tequila shots, drink number four. Then we did another round, drink number five, and my hand found his and he led me to a swanky speakeasy where we put away a few artisanal martinis, and that was drink number six and drink number seven, both doubles. Then we stumbled into a basement dive and somewhere between drink number eight and drink number nine, I started to whisper to Julian all of the things that I wanted him to do to me that night, only I might have actually been yelling and not whispering, but whatever, fuck it, it was great. And he put his hand on my hip and he kissed me hard and swung me against the bar, which was totally the hottest thing ever, but which also resulted in drink number 10 getting launched onto the floor, which didn't please the bartender who kicked us out, but that was fine because we had better places to be anyways, like Julian's bed. 
in my fantasy of our date, I figured we'd wake up at noon, have more sex, get brunch, then round out the morning by having sex again. I assumed that this first date would melt into a second date, which would melt into a third, and at a certain point we'd just move in together. In real life, I woke up to the sound of the zipper zipping. When I opened my eyes, Julian was fully dressed, staring down at me with a look of panic. He cleared his throat, looked at his phone, and said, you should probably get going. Completely missing the cues, I asked Julian where he wanted to go for brunch. He shook his head. There would be no brunch. Socialized woman that I am, I assumed that I had done something wrong. Maybe I had said something terrible and was too drunk to remember. Maybe it had been too soon to ask him to tie me to his bedpost. I don't know, maybe that's supposed to be like a third date kind of thing. <laughs> maybe I was too loud or too forward or just too much. Suddenly I wanted nothing more than to fulfill his request that I leave his apartment. But as I opened the front door, he said, wait. I waited. I waited for him to offer some sort of explanation, to tell me that everything was fine. But instead he said, I owe you $40. I had paid for the theater tickets, but he had paid for most of my drinks, and I was happy to just call it even. But Julian insisted on paying me back, even though he didn't have any cash. He insisted on walking with me in brutal silence to the closest ATM. The full force of my hangover hit me as soon as we stepped into the bodega. Stale food, burnt coffee, fluorescent lights. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, Julian was standing in front of me holding out two 20s. Thanks for a fun night, he said dryly. Anyone watching would have assumed that my pussy was only worth $40. Mm -hmm. What about you, he'd asked, what felt like a lifetime ago. What do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe not this, maybe anything other than this. I took off down the street as though I had any fucking clue where I was going, as if I wasn't stranded in Brooklyn at 10 in the morning, reeking of the night before. I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, waiting for some sort of divine intervention, and oh, FYI, it's a really, really bad idea to go two weeks without drinking and then have 10 drinks in one night. I wanted to die. I wanted to just give up and lay down in the gutter and abandon my body and come back as one of those weird ghosts that haunt the subway tunnels. My head was pounding, my ears were ringing, and my stomach felt like it was trying to violently escape my body. Having already abandoned my pride, I let a fart loose. <laughs> Only it turned out to be more than a fart. <laughs> the worst thing about sharding in the middle of winter is that you have to remove so many layers of clothing before you can even get to your afflicted underwear. The first place I found with a public bathroom was a gluten-free bakery. Thanks for playing. I had to brace myself against the stall to peel off my boots and both layers of tights. I tried to tell myself that things could be worse. I mean, things can always be worse, right? Like, what if the shard had happened two hours earlier? What if I'd sharded in Julian's bed? What if I'd sharded while we were having sex? Man, you know you're in bad shape when you catch yourself thinking, well, at least I can say I didn't poop during sex. I threw away my underwear, threw up, then took a look at myself in the mirror. Mascara tears, vomit on my chin, hickeys on my neck. I remembered the little voice in my head, AKA the voice of my friend Adam saying, it's time to go home, Emma. There's nothing for you here. I bought a muffin on my way out because the sign on the door said restroom for customers only and I'm a good person. <laughs> a few weeks after I got back to Chicago, a picture of Julian popped up on my Facebook. A picture of Julian and his girlfriend. You know, his monogamous girlfriend, the one that he'd just forgotten to tell me about. I suddenly found myself wishing that I had pooped in that motherfucker's bed. <laughs> I showed up at Adam's house screaming. I told him everything, the buildup, the date, the chart, the girlfriend. Adam's response, you should totally write about this. I looked that motherfucker in the eye and said, I am never, ever gonna write about this. I'm gonna do everything in my power to pretend that this never happened. But I need this story. Because a year after I met Julian, I made another attempt to quit drinking, one that stuck a little bit longer. Next month, I'll be two, two years sober. And whenever I'm tempted to believe that dating and sex are impossible without alcohol, all I have to do is visualize myself walking through Brooklyn at 10 in the morning, reeking of liquor and sex and shit and vomit, with a pounding headache, a broken heart, and a gluten-free muffin. <laughs> <laughs> Dying at that bed part. I, I want to hear all y'all's stories now. You guys, there's plenty.
plenty of seats if you want to fill in or if you're comfortable back there that's fine if you have an open seat next to you maybe just be conscientious that people are still kind of filling in um, but if you're cool back there we'll cool with you all right you guys one more time for Emma Alamo <laughs> Performer coming to the stage is Ada Chang. She is a professor turned storyteller and performing artist. She's been featured at storytelling shows in Chicago, Atlanta, Cedar Rapids, New York, Asheville, and Kansas City. Ada is the producer of the show Am I Man Enough, a storytelling podcast show where people tell stories to critically examine the culture of toxic masculinity. She is also the co producer and co host of Talk Stories, an American Asian diaspora. Diaspora Storytelling Show that showcases Asian American storytellers and performing artists. You can find her work at renegadeadachang.com. Please give it up for Ada Chang. When I was growing up in Taiwan, there were three American shows that were very dear to me. They taught me everything I needed to know about this country and about American people, about their struggles and dilemmas about their need for drama and solitude in the same time. <laughs> what are the three shows? Dallas, Dynasty, and Three's Company. <laughs> That's right. I used to watch them to learn English. When watching them, I thought to myself, I got to get to this country. Americans are having sex all the time. <laughs> Indeed, future generations would look at these shows and applaud the fact that they are ahead of their time in terms of the way they approach sexual matters. Three's company in particular. How can you not be impressed? A single man living with two single women and without having sex with each other or together as a group? And all the while, their dialogues are filled with sexual innuendos. <laughs> Looking from hindsight, Three's company while ahead of its time, is also symbolic of this country's hypocrisy. The hypersexualization of this society and the intense repression of people's sexual desire and agency at the same time, women's in particular. My father was never thrilled about these shows. He <laughs> used to turn off the TV when there was a kiss the scene or any hint of intimacy. We would then stare at a blank screen until he turned it back on again. One time, he was so frustrated with having to turn off the TV so often that he threw the remote on the floor and screamed, these damn Americans. <laughs> <laughs> the word blank described the screen perfectly as well as what was in my head about sex. Let me tell you something about sex in Taiwan. Nothing, because you are not supposed to have any or know anything about it. I'm from a culture and a society where sex is not taught or talked about, at least up to my generations. You live with your parents if you're single. You don't leave home until you're married. Theoretically, you are not supposed to have sex until you're married or until your parents die, whichever comes first. <laughs> Not that I pray my parents to die so I could have sex, never. So since we never learn about sex, we never learn about intimacy, love, or bodily integrity of any kind. So how did I learn about sex growing up? Let me offer you a few anecdotes conducive to my misunderstanding of sex. Up until my adult years, I knew very little about sex except one fact. One fact. <coughs> the sperm could swim and enter my vagina <laughs> by any means possible. <laughs> I didn't know how, but it managed to. So how did I learn about that? One time, I asked my older brother why he thought he could rule over me. He said, my little thing swam faster and I won the contest. <laughs> that was how I learned that, oh, sperm could swim. My father used to watch Japanese videos. 
some of which were legitimate drama, while for others, the sex scenes bordered on pornography. So how did I know that these videos depicted pornographic scenes? <laughs> because I used to sneak into my parents' bedroom, stole them, and watch them during the day while my parents were at work. <laughs> I will remember how and where, how I found these tapes, and I will put them back exactly how and where I found them. I will remember where my father paused the tapes and rewind them back to the exact spot where he paused them. I was smart. <laughs> In some way, I learned how to have sex the Japanese style. <laughs> I also often had men exposed to me, so they exposed themselves to me. One encounter particularly stood out to me, and that was the tipping point. My best friend in high school, let's call her Jin Jin, and I were sitting on the last row of the bus. She was sitting by the window, and I was sat sitting right next to her. A man got on the bus, sat right next to me. My friend's, her head was turned facing left, so she could see everything that was happening to my left. As we continued on the right, at some point, I turned around and glanced at the man, our eyes locked. He then gestured me to look down on his lap. I did, and saw his exposed genitalia, a fully blown penis, or hard on the technical term, <laughs> which I didn't know at the time. I immediately dragged my friend off the bus. After I got off, I, I told her what happened, to which she replied, Oh, no wonder. I kept on thinking why his thumb was so big. <laughs> <laughs> that is the moment when I realized I cannot not learn about sex. Something has to change when people around you can distinguish <coughs> a fully blown penis and a thumb. <laughs> Something drastic has to happen when you don't even recognize the tool for possible violence and oppression and you take it to be a salute to your womanhood. I started teaching at a university here in Chicago in 2001. I taught subjects on gender, uh, sexuality, sex, masculinity. <coughs> I watched younger generations of women or people exhibit <laughs> the same kind of vulnerability and innocence that I experienced. I had many students without sex education or with minimal fear-based sex warnings. Few students were taught about pleasure, different sexual orientations, negotiations in relationships, and integrity of their bodies. I watched them as they revealed that they were sexually assaulted, yet struggled to define whether it was rape or sexual assault altogether. I watched a younger version of myself unfold in front of me right in my classroom. We are generations apart, growing up in different countries, different cultures, different continents, yet I witnessed the same naivety, the same confusion, the same lack of knowledge, and the same level of misinformation among my students. My students' experiences have pained me as much as my own. There would be no liberation without accurate knowledge, without access to information, without access to vital services, without agency over sex or without choice, over one's own body. I arrived in this country on July 15, 1991. I thought I was free from the gender oppression of my culture and society. I didn't realize that I was simply stepping into different sets of rules for being a woman in this country. What transpired in 1991, month after my arrival? This country was engulfed with the Anita Hill Thomas Clarence sexual harassment case. Mocked by both black and white communities, she was asked to choose her loyalty between gender and race. And that was my first lesson 
in understanding womanhood and feminism in this country. It took 26 years after Anita Huil was publicly crucified in this country that we witnessed the spreading of the Me Too movement starting in 2017. I hope it doesn't take another quarter century before we stop blaming victims for the sexual violence that they experience and before we tackle our cultural hypocrisy between hypersexualizing women and penalizing them for exercising their own sexual agency and desire. Thank you. coughing attack here, so pardon the interruption. <laughs> um, and also, just a reminder, are you guys able to hear okay in the back? Okay, cool. No mics, so you know, extra projection here. My students can always hear me, but... Um. <laughs> All right, this is going great. Let's give it up one more time for Ada Chang. <laughs> All right, our next performer, Mackenzie Chin, is a poet, actor, and teaching artist whose work has appeared in Pink, Crab Fat Magazine, The Femme, Jute, Sundog Lit, and others. She is a part of Growing Concerns Poetry Collective with hip-hop artist Michaeli DeVille and musician Jeff Austin. The collective released its inaugural album, We Hear, Thank You For Noticing, in August 2017, hell yes, and published its first book of poems, Five Fifths, available through Candor Arts in January 2018. You can learn more about her work at mckinseychin.com. Please give it up for Mackenzie Chin. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that intro. Um, I'm going to read a couple of uh, a couple of pieces. Uh, one is from our book, Growing Things uh, on Five Fifths. But the uh, the one I want to share with you first is actually pretty new. And this is you are the first ears that uh, get to hear this out loud. So Ooh. I'm nervous, and this should be really fun. Okay. <laughs> Maybe the older you get, the more you become interested in who you used to be. And when I say who you used to be, I mean all the women who came before you, before you were even the thought of you. Maybe the older you get, the more interested you are in your grandmother, Augusta, from whom you lived too far to ever really know, but who, after giving him ten children, left her husband, who, as far as you can tell from the pictures, only ever looked mean and scornful, and went fishing in the Alabama deltas with his sons, and made his daughters cook and clean the catch. You seek the stories of how she left him in the 70s, when leaving husbands was still new, and went to stay with her people in Cleveland. Maybe the older you get, the more you know that to arrive, first you have to leave. Maybe age makes you see more clearly the structure of the bones in your face. And your great aunt Mary is in there somewhere, the one who had the scar on her face from the knife fight during her days of running numbers. Or maybe from the time she killed that man she was seeing, the man who knocked her around from time to time. And after all, she told him if he touched her again, that'd be the last thing he'd ever do, and well, he did. And of the whole thing, all great aunt Mary had to say was that she didn't mean to kill him, but she's not sorry she did. <laughs> maybe the older you get, the better you wield the torch you were handed at your conjuring. Maybe all you are is stories, and even the stories your mother never told you because Hollywood can romanticize mid-century Southern racism and black poverty all at once, but the actual living of it is not how your mother wants you to know yourself. Maybe the older you get, the more you reach back, the way your grandmother Augusta does now, nearly a century old the way she leaves her house in the dead of thick Alabama nights, walking in her gown toward the main road, which will take her somewhere maybe only she and her memories know, until your mother retrieves her like she always does, showing her the way back to her own house, asking your grandmother, asking her mother, have you heard from my people? And I want to read just one more for you. This is one that I got to perform at um, last year's The Fly Honey Show. Has anybody been to like The Fly Honey Show? Okay, these folks have, but all y'all should be there. <laughs> it happens every year in the summer, and it's the best, booziest, burlesquiest time you will have all summer. So you should check it out. Fly Honey yes, Show. Yes. Uh, this is called Peace After Revolution. 
The free and ungoverned body is a radical threat to injustice. If my body was free and ungoverned, it would be a radical threat to injustice. The free and ungoverned body is a radical threat to injustice. The free and ungoverned body is a radical threat to injustice. The free and ungoverned body is a radical threat to injustice. The free and ungoverned body is a radical threat to injustice. If my body was free and ungoverned, Viola Davis would have played Nina Simone in the movie about Nina Simone in the story. If my body was free, the hallways of the health clinic somewhere in the middle of Texas that also provides abortions would never be found by the state of Texas to be somehow too narrow and subsequently shut down. If my body was free, all lives matter would never have been a thing, and if my body was free, black lives matter would have never had to be a thing. If my body was free, my camera would be my camera, and my camera wouldn't also be, at times, my only means for defense. If my body was free, I would have gone to the Women's March. All the women there would have also been the women saying Eric's name, and Rikia's name, and Terrence's name, and Tamir's name, and Sandra's name, and Freddie's name, and Stefan's name, and Alton's name, and Philando's name, and names I can't remember anymore because there are so many. But these women would have remembered those names for me, but these women don't remember those names because they've never uttered them. If my body was free, 53% of white women would have voted differently. If my body was free, maybe I would have a child, and she would be dark. She would be a midnight. She would be solace and joy and rest and wonder. And if my body was free, I'd have two more children after that, darker still. And I would not have to worry what world they would inherit. And I would also have a career. And if my body was free, I would not have to choose between the two. Or I would have only my career, my career and maybe my cat, and this would be fine, and no one would be waiting for me to find someone because my body, remember, would be free and my own and inherently complete. And no one would dare call me shrew or bitch or bossy, or they would call me bossy. They call me bossy as fuck, and bossy would be the highest compliment and not easily earned. If my body was free, the state would know its tasers and batons are the toys, are the tools of a toy soldier army in the face of my diamond spine. If my body was free, I would free my brothers. If my body was free, I would free my brothers. If my body was free, I would free all my brothers. If my body was free, my twerk would be holy and bring rain. There would be no droughts. The word drought, holy and represented from the Oxford English Dictionary to the Urban Dictionary. There would be no word in even the most ancient of languages for such a thing as a drought, I would be ungoverned, ungovernable. I am not smiling. See me not smiling for you? I am not smiling for you. Instead, I am an eight-armed god occupied with the carrying of thousands of years and the weight of now. Gold artifacts and pyramids, sharecropper songs, the god particle, and Beyonce's next number one. I am not smiling for you. Rather, I tilt my head back, lips apart, a trumpet sounds. A flock of wild doves escape my mouth. They chaos the sky. Let the feathers of my doves clog the gears of every weapon in this city. Let them descend a soft plague on the governor's house, the mayor's office, obscuring all nonsense issuing forth from their pen, blinding their eyes with the feathers of the doves from the mouth of my free body. My free body. Yes, ask me to smile now, and I will phoenix a meteor crashing into the earth and my ashes will cover everything you thought you knew. And my ashes will cover everything you thought you knew. And then the unfolding of my arm, and the first beat of my great wing, and then your life feels like it feels like you probably are all right up next jill hopkins is one of the hosts of morning amp on vocalo radio local radio if y'all don't know it get in tune 91.1 fm she also hosts live events in chicago for the moth story slam on npr in addition to public radio microphones, she also projects into them at the Paper Machete Live Magazine, comedy stages, and for the bands Satan's Boner and Torgos. Jill is a Chicago native, and she loves her city with all her heart. Please give it up for Jill Hopkins. <laughs> all right. All right. So 
full circle, I got to read this story uh, for the uh, record release party for Gorgeous Concerns. But this is the first time that I'm reading it in a well-lit room, so that's new. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Um, and also, I'm almost 39, so here we go. Yeah, girl. Um, <laughs> uh, my mother let me think for almost 20 years that the Mormons slut-shamed me out of the church instead of telling me that this particular group were racist. Uh, it wasn't the first time that I'd experienced something like that, but we didn't have a name for it back then. We didn't call it slut-shaming in the 90s. Uh, but the first time that happened to me was the day after a daytime house party my freshman year of high school where everyone found out that I didn't blow this junior in a locked bedroom. And uh, my yearbook from that year has a lot of entries addressed to Blue Balls Hopkins. But that's <laughs> another story for another day. So picture it. Sicily, 1922. Wait, that's a Golden Girls reference. That's a wrong story. This was in Chicago in 1997. It was the day of my high school graduation, and I just found out that I was half a credit short to walk the stage. I was a terrible high school student, which really disappointed a lot of people because I was an excellent grammar school student. I, at this point in my life, was the picture of wasted potential. Yeah. Summer school was in my 18-year-old future, and I was devastated. But since I was technically an adult, uh, my mom said there wasn't really any way for her to punish me, that life would take care of that eventually. <laughs> and uh, that's real shade. That's real black mom shade. Uh, you wonder where drag queens got it from? It's black moms. Yeah, ask them, they'll tell you to leave that. Uh, to cheer me up, this nice young man that I'd been going to church with for the better part of a decade asked if he could take me out on a date that night. Uh, we had been flirty for a while, as flirty as two awkward churchy virgins could be. Uh, so I happily accepted, and we had a lovely evening in Hyde Park. He took me to Medici, and we ate pizza, and we walked over to Promontory Point. Let me tell you, this date was dope as fuck. We were holding hands like you've never seen. And uh, then, when he dropped me off at my house, I invited him in. I invited him into the house. I let dude in on some hot under the shirt action. <laughs> it was honestly the least I could do, and I liked making out, so it was a win-win. Uh, now earlier in this story, I referred to myself as an awkward churchy virgin, which was 100% true. But I was not inexperienced in the ways of romance. I would had a couple boyfriends by then. All of those relationships, however, ended terribly, as my awkwardness around boys really was the guiding force of every interpersonal interaction I had between the ages of 12 and 17. But I was freshly 18 and finally figuring my shit out. Uh, I had to stop overthinking everything and just start to accept my feelings of sexual independence as something to embrace instead of run from. So when this cutie, who looked like the singer from Sunny Day Real Estate, which is an excellent band, if you don't know, and that compliment <laughs> meant something in 1997. Uh, he wanted to round second base, and I was like, bet. And it felt <laughs> fantastic to be able to say yes with confidence and excitement. And by the way, when we talk about enthusiastic consent, that's what we're talking about. But that is also another story for another day. So I carried that enthusiasm and confidence with me until Sunny Day's final consultation with the priesthood men of the church uh, before he was to leave on his two-year mission. And that's when he sold me out. Threw me under the bus. He narked, cattled, he snitched. <laughs> All of the boys and adult men in this church that I was already becoming disenchanted with now knew that I was a brazen hussy. Words spread around the church like my legs did not. Because <laughs> nothing really even happened in the grand scheme of things. I was still a virgin. Kissing isn't a sin, I thought, and everybody likes boobs. <laughs> <laughs> so some context here. I was not raised as part of the Mormon church. I was born into a Catholic family and attended Catholic school from nursery to eighth grade. I was a, a curious and kind of bookish kid, though, and that played out in a theological way as well. Uh, I tried to go to church with those Baptists that come to your house on that school bus from Indiana, but I did go one time and they were burning New Kids on the Block and New Edition cassettes on the day that I went, and the smell of burning, pla burning plastic was bested only by the smell of intolerance and questionable taste in music for 10-year-olds. I tried to get down with the Buddhists, 
but every time I try to meditate, I fall asleep, and I don't think that's what that religion is about. <laughs> so I settled on the Mormons because my aunt went there, my mom's older sister. Uh, they had worse songs than the Baptists, but better songs than the Catholics, and they had snacks, <laughs> and the church was in Hyde Park, uh, which beat Crown Point, Indiana, by leaps and bounds. Uh, however, I found out that the disenchantment that I was feeling towards this particular church was how I felt about all of the churches, and I haven't been back since. If you can't accept me at second base, you don't deserve me at home plate. <laughs> I couldn't and don't see myself pumping out a bunch of church babies for any organization that looks down on the fun part of making them. <laughs> so uh, when this uh, story came up last summer, I was talking to my mom about something else entirely. I wasn't expecting any new information to come to light. It's been about 20 years, and I'm married to an entirely different white guy now. I have not uh, thought even once really about the young man who made the mistake of looking a tit horse in the mouth in quite some time. So uh, when I got to the part about feeling shunned for being a sexual person, my mom said, oh no, that, that wasn't why. It's because you're black. I'm sorry, what? Oh, she, her, uh, his parents didn't want their son getting involved with a black girl, so instead of making themselves look like racist, they made you look like a slut. Uh, your aunt knew, and she uh, chewed them out. So why didn't anybody tell me? She said it seemed like it would hurt your feelings less not to. And maybe she was right. I was pissed about what I thought was happening. I spent my 20s being as sex positive as I could be. I fucked for those who could not fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I was having sex despite organized religion. It was my superpower and it scared people. But in that brief time I have lived with the truth, I think, my mother knew damn well how I felt about all that. She knew how angry I was at my family and that boy and those grown men who shamed a young woman for daring to enjoy her life and her body. She knew that I wanted nothing to do with God anymore because his followers treated me like shit for having an 18-year-old sexual appetite. The same God that I know that she loves with all of her heart and devotes her life to. My mom was and is a single mom. Sometimes she jokingly refers to me as her disco accident. Uh, and so she's no stranger to being made to feel like a slut. When I was born, she was in her very early 20s and still living at home. Her older siblings were all in committed relationships and had children and were delivering that black mom shade on her and her choices. They were supportive, but you know how it, it can be. So my mom knew what it was like to feel the stigma of that imaginary scarlet letter A and of people question your willing acceptance of the biological desire to have sex and enjoy it. She knew all of that and was still willing to let me turn my back on the thing that she believes in more than anything else in the world because it would be easier on her only daughter than me knowing that someone hated me because of the color of my skin. But she didn't know what was gonna come next. And honestly, at the time, I didn't either. I was to become adamant about my freedoms to make choices about my body, so much so that it turned me into a huge champion for women's rights and sexual freedom before I'd even started college. It made me determined to lose my virginity that summer. Spoiler alert, I did. It was only okay. <laughs> <laughs> I dove into erotica and learning about kinks. I found a long-term partner that was willing to explore all of that newfound knowledge with me, and that was awesome. Uh, I moved out of the house so I could have a room of my own to experiment in with all sorts of partners. I became a bona fide card-carrying slut, and I loved every second of it. Dealing with how people felt about my choices with my body was easier than acknowledging that the worst criticism I will ever receive is about something I have no control over. I don't blame my mother for doing what she thought was right. In fact, part of me thanks her for that lie. I probably would have shut down emotionally if I'd known that those people were racist, honestly. I didn't have the knowledge to fight that sort of thing back then, but I did have a body. And this body, your body, is really scary to some people. Women's bodies are so frightening to some people that that's why they fight so hard to control it, and to keep young girls from knowing just how powerful their bodies are. So I encourage you all to learn all you can about your body. Be safe with it and treat it right and have fun with it without hurting anybody else. Treat your body like we want other people to treat their guns. <laughs> but know that your body is way more capable of anything than any weapon is. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little gun snark in there. <laughs> it's been coming up a lot. 
All right, you guys, one more time for Jill Hopkins. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the crowd just keeps getting bigger and bigger. All right, here we go. Maggie Kubley is a performance slash video artist and storyteller slash songwriter living in Chicago. She was born in Indiana, grew up in Indiana, and received her BA in theater from Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, before moving to Chicago in 2006. The music of Celine Neon, Maggie's band for whom she writes all the music, has been featured in national commercials and performed in venues throughout Chicago and Los Angeles. Maggie has written, produced, and performed nine music videos, one short film, and three multimedia performance works. She's released three studio albums and performed at countless amounts of concerts across America. She's currently preparing to release a new EP and is writing and producing a web series about an aging pop music duo. You can follow her on Instagram and Twitter, and her website is maggiekubley.com. Please put your hands together for Maggie Kubley. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone here knows their number, like the number of people you've had sex with. Uh, great. I'm not here to compare. I honestly don't want to know. I don't know mine. And I'm sure there's some sort of equation that I could use to figure it out, like number of guys I've fucked times uh, like the amount of dicks I sucked <laughs> minus uh, the hand jobs I've given, <laughs> carry the one straight up my ass, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying you probably know yours. I don't know mine, it's probably really big, but my point is that for how big my number is now, I actually started out pretty modestly. Um, I don't think when I was younger that there was very many people who really kind of like saw my like inner slut. Um, one of those people actually happened to be my dad. <gasps> Let me set the scene. I was in high school. That's the scene, okay? That's the scene, right? Think about how like weird and <laughs> fucking horny you are in high school. I was so weird. I was so horny, I masturbated a lot. But I did not have sex, I was not having sex. As a matter of fact, I was doing some research to write this piece and I looked at some of my old high school journals. Okay. And in one I actually wrote, I don't think I'm going to like to have sex. I went on to explain that this was because uh, I didn't like the feeling of boys putting their fingers inside of me. So, I mean, I was basing what I thought sex was going to feel like off of getting finger banged by a 15 year old. So just like, <laughs> cut me some slack there, okay? Um, yeah, did not think I'd like sex. What I did like was sexy dancing, okay? I was a big fan of MTV's The Grind, yes. which, okay, if you haven't gone on YouTube The Grind in a while, you should. If you don't know what The Grind is, I'm old. Uh, the Grind is a show, it was on MTV. It starred gorgeous people dancing in a club setting that MTV made. It had like a lot of spinning gears, it had some like orange lights and a bong machine and it had attractive people dancing, you know? They were like doing this thing and they were like doing this thing and whatever this thing was. <laughs> and I was practicing these moves in front of my bedroom mirror, getting ready to unleash them on bum ba da bing 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 high school dances, okay? When I was in junior high, they had two dances all year. When I was in high school, they had a dance after every home football game. Where, 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 and me and my friend, would get into that cafeteria, that's where the high school dances were, and just go ham. We were just doing the most uh, over-exaggerated, sexually aggressive moves, and always just with each other. We were never dancing with boys. Bless her heart, bless her heart, Angie had a wicked case of acne, okay? And I was just too busy, like, dancing like a freak. Nobody was trying to dance with us. We were not getting any. But you couldn't tell it by the way we were dancing. We were just air humping as if our life depended on it. We were like shaking our teen boobs all over the place. 
5P teen boobs. Yeah. <laughs> I just miss you so much. <laughs> oh my god. Um, there were some kids, you know, most kids were just kind of standing there like casually, like step touching. You know, occasionally they maybe do a little of this. And me and Angie were just aggressively sex dancing. We were just doing it. So one night, I was supposed to be done at the dance at 11, but I stayed at the dance till 11.45. And I came out and I got in the car when my dad picked me up and he was real quiet. And I was like, oh, uh, sorry, dad. Huh, huh. Oh, I lost track of time. Oh, I'm bullshit teen stuff. <laughs> Very quiet. Drove me home. Very quiet. Pulled into the garage. Very quiet. Sat there in the dark. Very quiet. Then he's like, you know, when I come to pick you up at the dance, I just, when I say 11, I mean 11, and I, I don't want to walk in there and, and see you dancing, and I don't even know what he said after that, because he had seen me dancing. <laughs> he had seen me dancing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was so embarrassed, and what's more, I was dead. I was an actual dead person who would never dance again, except... <laughs> Then my dad never said anything else about it. Think of him walking in there, my mild-mannered, soft-spoken, small-town family practitioner father, walking into this cafeteria, scanning the kids dancing, and seeing his daughter just over in the corner, getting it, with no one in particular. <laughs> to know something then. He didn't know what he knew, but I think deep down he knew that his daughter was going to be a little slutty. <laughs> he knew that she was going to have some threesomes in college. Just kidding. He knew she was going to be different. And if my dad had told me to change myself. If my dad had told me to stop that behavior instead of just murmuring something about how we weren't going to tell my mom and then just leaving the whole conversation there in the front seat of my family's Lincoln, if he had told me not to be a slut, I would have listened. I was a dork. I was a good kid. I just wanted to make my parents happy. So if my dad had told me in that moment that sexually expressing myself was wrong, the part of me that grew up to become an artist whose work largely centers around how it's okay for women to be sexual, whatever that means to them, that part of me would have suffered if he hadn't have just let me be the sexy dancing freak I wanted to be. <laughs> I don't know who I would have been. I don't know where I would be, but maybe I would know my number. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, you guys, keep it going for Maggie Cooley. Teen boobs. Half of these girls still have their teen boobs, precious little babies. Um, I turned 40 this year, and so I told someone I was making a 40 before 40 list, and they were like, you haven't slept with 40 people yet? And I was like, that is not the list. That is not what I'm trying to do, actually. And um, probably, yes, probably have. I think the last time I counted it was around 30, and I don't even know when that was. So hey, yeah, give it up for your number, whatever it may be. It doesn't even matter, you don't have to count. Um, but I was having this conversation with a guy friend recently and I was like, does it matter? Like, is this, are you bothered by this? No, I just, well, what do you think the number should be? Well, you're 40, you've been single, okay? And I was like, yeah, see, it adds up. It just, they just add up, you know? Stay single, live your life. All right, here we go. Julia Weiss is a Chicago-based writer and performer, a former member of Second City's Nas national touring company. Julia is currently a head writer at Cards of Humanity. That's that game. People write those cards, y'all. <laughs> she regularly performs at Paper Machete at the Green Mill and Your Fucked Up Relationship at I.O. 
Julia fucked up her taxes in 2015 and owes the IRS a lot of money. You can still be successful, don't worry. Follow her on Twitter at Weisty. Give it up for Julia Weiss. You need to be so I'm good. Hey, ooh, I'm okay. Um, uh, yeah, sex is cool, dancing is cool. Um, you know what is also cool? Body dysmorphia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right response. Um, uh, this piece, like, well, content warning, um, I know that this is something that as we are in like a really wonderful moment of body positivity. I feel like we still don't often dive into a lot of like the ugly side of body dysmorphia and eating disorder. Um, so if those things are troubling topics to you, I'm, I am going to touch on them. Um, not, and by touch on them, I mean like literally this is what it's about. I don't know why I said touch on, because it's fully <laughs> that. <laughs> Okie doke. Um, dope, let's do this. Um, I have no idea what I look like but I think I'm almost as fat now as I used to think I was. <laughs> Buttons pop and seams buckle on clothes that once hung loose, and my phone must have heard me lament this fact because all my targeted ads are screaming promises at me. This app will help me walk the right way, the way that makes me be thin, um, or teach me to run so I'll be thin, uh, or teach me how to use the obscenity that is my own body weight to build muscle, but more importantly, be thin. Companies try to sell me diets that are just repackaged eating disorders, but ones you don't have to hide from your parents. Uh, or maybe they haven't heard me yell at my own naked body in the mirror. Maybe they just send these to me because I'm a woman. They go after all of us. God forbid we remember we're humans all our own with value outside of their context. If our bodies are free, then our sex is free, and then we're dangerous. Every day, I'm reminded that I'm further from an impossible idea than I once was. One that falls so far outside of my own values that I am shocked. Shocked that it consumes me the way I consume Lunchables pizzas, with unbroken cutting focus. <laughs> <laughs> Let me be clear, I don't believe in this shit. I think it's fucking bad and oppressive and stupid. I think that all bodies are beautiful and I also think that physical beauty shouldn't be a marker for human value. Humans aren't vases or paintings. Women aren't vases or paintings. We deserve to be as ugly and as loved as any married man who's married to a hot woman on TV. <laughs> I don't believe in this shit, but I download apps. Sometimes I even pay for them with money that I do owe the IRS. Um, I screenshot illustrations of eight simple moves to tone arms, or every ultimate 15 minute ab routine, or of the 20 squats that will make my ass look like Kim's. I will not do these things. My ass will not look like Kim's. A, it's her ass. Let Kim have her ass and let me have mine. <laughs> and B, I don't save these things because I'm going to do them. I'm a hoarder. I hoard these reminders to hate myself in case I get cocky and forget. I take Zoloft and smoke weed to manage life in this raping, murdering, unjust world. And I scarf down snacks and I rip my jeans and I grab at new fat in the mirror asking how it got there. I used to handle the chaos and self-loathing differently, so I dare myself to start puking again, just for a little bit, just to get things under control. Starve myself like I did when I was younger. Starve and puke and hate myself for it. Feel weak and sick and faint for it, but be protected by it. At least then, I'm the one doing the hurting. I'm not being hurt by anyone else. I don't know what I look like, but my doctor likes to read back my weight to me and shake her head when I go in for a checkup. Let's add a generic Wellbutrin to curb your weight gain, she said, so we tried it. It gives me headaches, I told her. Give it time. It makes my heart feel weird. Wait it out. I stayed up last night meticulously dreaming up ways to kill myself. I even watched the hours for inspiration. Well, there are six more generics we can try. What am I expected to endure to lose this weight? How dangerous of an enemy is it? How fat am I? I'm 5'8", about 200 pounds. I don't know what that looks like because I haven't known how to look at myself since I was a little girl. 
And I look back on the scrawny girl I was, and I wonder why Jessica lifted up my dress in front of the class in third grade to say, you're fat. How she knew that that word fat, which is simply a substance, had been made into a weapon. I wonder why my ballet teacher told me that that, that skinny kid, that she was too fat to dance. There's an athleisure wear store on Southport. I actually think the entire Southport corridor is just athleisure wear stores. <laughs> and um, but there's this one, and it's for women, obviously. Um, and next to it is one for little girls. We've always raised boys to be men and girls to be their slight, manageable wives. We're shockingly honest about it in this era of pussy hats. I have no idea what I look like, but I know I'm not pretty anymore. I can tell because men can't see me now. They can't ignore me in meetings because they legitimately cannot see me. There is a man in here right now who's wondering why no one is up here talking and how is that dog in the building and why is it wearing a dress? Time and sun and strain have changed my once clear, smooth skin. Squinting at my phone has given me wrinkles around my eyes. My short, dull hair sticks out and I can't fix it. I look like my mom the year my grandma died. She was 12 years older than I am now and that's who I look like. I look exactly like her. I walk by reflective surfaces and think, who's that bitch who looks like my mom the year my grandma died? <laughs> and it's me, I'm the bitch. I'm the bitch who looks like my mom the year my grandma died, only with less of a neck but slightly better style. Now my mom is on what she calls a diet, uh, where she eats one meal a day. That was my eating disorder in high school, the one she grounded me for. When I was pretty, it was easy to say that female beauty is a bullshit value that my value lies in my heart and my brain, that being pretty shouldn't be a standard by which I'm judged. Pretty me was right, but ugly me gets no reward for her values. I reject this, but I don't reject this. I look at other women with big, beautiful bodies, powerful bodies that can lift things and stretch and run and dance, big, beautiful bodies that can't do much of those things but are still round and soft and gorgeous, but my body, my body, I look at with disdain. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't look at my body with disdain when it was smaller, when I was younger and had long hair and was pretty. We hurt ourselves to be a thing that doesn't matter. We hate ourselves for aging. I am an Oprah-ass bitch who loves bread, and I am not allowed to love the softness that bread puts on my body. Who the hell would I be to love my fat? The arrogance to love my own body, my round gut, my fat tits, that is unbecoming of a woman. I'm supposed to fuck with the lights off now if any man is willing to do me the favor of fucking me. I don't know what I look like and my feelings about this are a mess. Are they a mess for you? Do you grapple with this confusion all the time of how to feel beautiful and also how to reject the idea that you should have to feel beautiful and feeling embarrassed for feeling beautiful when you don't look like the kind of person who's supposed to feel beautiful? And don't tell me that it's all about confidence that confidence is the sexiest thing and that insecurity is a boner killer because I'm a woman and confidence is a battle for a lot of us and these are not choices. I feel like there's this Venn diagram when it comes to body and beauty. One circle is have to, we have to be thin, we have to wear makeup, we have to look right. One circle is want to, I want to feel strong, I want to play with makeup, I want to look like me. And so many of us grapple in that middle space aware of what's expected, but also into creativity and expression. I want to mute this. I just want to mute it. I want to divorce now from the eons that built now. I want us all, all genders, all ages, all everyone to decorate our faces with fucking Fenty and use clothing, clothing to make ourselves into art. I want us to be beautiful because we're living and thinking and expressing. I don't want to hate myself for not being a whisper-thin woman with bird bones and a gentle voice that makes men feel safe. And I don't want whisper-thin women with bird bo bones and gentle voices to feel like they're bad for being a thing that simply matches as what is expected of all of us. And I want to know what I look like. And I want to love it because it's me and I'm this amazing person with cool ideas and a nice voice and kind eyes and dope tits and one very good ankle. <laughs> because part of me thinks I am beautiful even though it doesn't matter. Part of me thinks I deserve to fuck and to fuck with the lights on. I want to know who I'd be if I didn't have to be anyone but the human I am. 32 years of messaging about what a woman is supposed to be, what a feminist is supposed to be. I don't want that. I just want to be myself. I want to be her, be them, be whoever they are for a while. 
without fear or compromise. about like a little more than 15 minutes for like questions and dialogue. Um, do y'all wanna, I don't know, come up here or hang? Do you wanna stand or sit? I don't know, do you guys have questions? Anyone have a question or a comment to kick it off? Maybe not, everyone might be kind of shy, so let's just <laughs> hang for a minute and see. No, it's okay. Oh, hey, here's one. And then you're next. Maybe it's just me. Hi, Justin. No, it's maybe it's just me. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Where is the male representation in the slut talk? There is no male representation in slut talk. No. This is a show for women, and this is about women's sexuality. Um, male representation dominates every other stage show platform that you see. Um, slut lives specifically in the experience of being a woman. So it's actually, when men use the word, it's actually uh, a taking from the culture where it already derived. Um, what Slut Talk aims to do is reclaim and redefine the word. Um, and the reason I don't include men in this show is because um, I'm not interested in men's voices on this topic, to be completely honest. And I uh, stand pretty strongly by that, and a lot of people have uh, response to that that they don't agree with. Um, and so, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone, 